And so, welcome everyone. We are starting off a new year. If you had any hope that this new year was going to be a, a really great year, like, wow, this is 2021. going to be it's just amazing. Forget 2020. It's just going to be an awesome start to 2021. I think that was probably late the rest this week if you have internet access or own a TV. So anyways, uh, I am excited in light of all that's going on to be starting a new book study. In fact, we're going to go through the book of First and Second Peter, which I think deals with a lot of things we're dealing with in our culture. So we're calling this new study Crazy World, Good God. Crazy World, Good God. And that's what Peter was dealing with, this is the craziness of the world around him and yet the goodness of God. And so if uh, Mad Max and his crew taking over the uh, house this week seemed a little strange, um, and if the mainstreaming of Marxism is uh, a little unstabilizing, certainly we look to the Bible and we say, wow, do you know in the Bible God's people have every reason for peace, hope, and joy? And every reason to have a stable, confident approach to life in the future. And so when you look at it, when you look at the Bible, you say, man, you read this and go, man, God's people are the most stable, the most joyful, the most peaceful. In the midst of a crazy world, everything's okay inside, even though nothing's okay out there. So I think the book of First and Second Peter will be very helpful to us. Because it doesn't take being a prophet to see where things are going. It just takes having internet service, right? And you can pretty well assume that things are not getting better in our world or in our culture or in our country. And so, as we're looking at this book, I, I hope that it's an encouragement to you, brings peace to you, as well as brings confidence to you, because I think that's why Peter wrote it. And so, in this series, Crazy World, Good God, we're going to start this week with... Find the blessings. So in difficulty, find the blessings. Because what happens is, a lot of times in Christianity, Christianity is pictured as people trying to say, God, keep us from difficulty. God, allow me to go around difficulty. God, keep me from any difficult challenges. And the Bible is often saying just the opposite. God is going to protect you through the difficulties. Most of the time, it's not keeping us from difficulties. Most of the time, it's God keeping us through difficulties. And we see that. In Peter as well. So uh, let me give you the setting, make this sound familiar. Peter is in Rome, the greatest nation on earth at that time. It had the biggest economy, the most powerful military, and yet it was in the process of self destructing. Do you see any parallels to where we might find ourselves? You see, despite the Romans' wealth and their power, despite the vastness of their nation and all their resources, the nation of the Empire of Rome was pulling itself apart because you have all of these people groups and all of these religions and all of these things and everyone had an opinion on how life was to be lived in Rome, right? So it just started pulling itself apart and conflict and difficulty. And so you can see a lot of parallels between what Peter was dealing with, and what we're dealing with in America. And on top of all that, you had this new movement called Christianity. And so Christians are sort of in the middle of this, and come to find out over time, all of these factions and all of these difficulties could find one common ground. What was that? We don't like Christians. We don't like God's people. We ransacked Jerusalem and destroyed it. But um, I think you'll find that there's many, many parallels to what Peter was facing and what we're facing today. And so, when we think about it, what happened then, too, as it does today, is all of these factions started to make their way into the church. So instead of the church saying, we have the answer, it's Jesus, and let's go out and tell the world, all of these factions in the world were creeping into the church and clouding out Jesus. But we see that, right? If you look at our culture, you have all kinds of different issues that are pulling the culture apart. Justice, right? Social justice. The economy. Healthcare. Education. It's all kinds of factors, right? 
And in any given church around the country today, if you were to ask me, we would have any of a myriad of answers on all those things are, right? In fact, within Christianity, Christianity today is being torn apart by grasping hold of these issues and tearing you apart. And so those issues come back into the church, rather than the church taking Jesus out of those issues, right? Out into the world. And so you say, what is the solution to all these issues? What is the solution to justice? It's Jesus, right? What is the solution to the economy? It's Jesus. What is the solution to all of our problems? It's Jesus, right? And you say, man, that is so overly simplified. But in reality, I think God gave us a simple solution because he assumed we weren't that smart, right? So he says, man, if you aren't that smart, I'll give you a super simple solution. It's Jesus, right? So Jesus really is the solution. We need to figure out what Jesus looks like as the solution so that we can then take Jesus out there rather than bring all their problems here, right? And so that's what Peter was doing in his day. And so in 1 Peter chapter 5, he gives us sort of the purpose of his writing. Chapter 5, he says this. Through Savannah, our brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it, right? And so he's writing to encourage them to, and, and so when we talk about encouragement, we're talking about putting courage into them, right? That is what encouragement does. It puts hope and courage into us. Do we need encouragement? Yes. Do we need that infusion of courage? Yes. We do, right? Hebrews talks about it in chapter 3. It says encourage, or put courage into one another in that sense, day after day, right? So what are we encouraging one another? We're encouraging one another, putting courage into one another, by reminding one another of the beauty of Christ, the kingdom of God, all of the promises of God, all the blessings of God. The world, in Romans 132, encourages or puts courage into one another over the wrong things, right? In Romans 132, they not only know these things are worthy of death, but they what? Give encouragement to others to do them. So they're putting courage into others to do the wrong thing. We're putting courage into one another to do the right thing. That's encouraging, right? There's wrong forms of encouragement. There's right forms of encouragement. Right forms of encouragement are we encourage one another with the promises and the character and, and all that is God according to the Word of God. Everything about God, we encourage one another with these things. So we're in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. He says this. Peter, verse 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Now, one, one thing just to, right off the bat that's encouraging is when we talk about Peter, we're going to talk about a book of encouragement, we're going to talk about a book that calls us to holiness and obedience. When you think of Peter's life, do you think of a stellar example of obedience? This guy was often a guy who did what? Got himself in trouble with his words, right? Remember when Jesus rebukes him at one point? Actually, Peter decides it's a good idea to rebuke Jesus. Yes or no? Good idea to rebuke Rebuke Jesus? Bad idea, right? Peter decides to rebuke Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, get behind me. Satan. Parents, you ever use that with your kids? Get behind me, little Satan. It'd be pretty harsh, wouldn't it? You're like, I thought about it, right? I know. It'd be a harsh rebuke, right? So when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, you go, wow, Peter had a couple issues, right? And if you remember, Peter is the one who pulls the sword, goes to the whack off the guy's head in defense of Jesus, and shortly afterwards does what? Little girl comes up. He was one of Jesus' followers. He's like, you beep, 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 beep. I don't even know the guy, right? Just starts ranting and cussing like a sailor, right? He says, wow, this was Peter, right? So there's something endearing about Peter because he was not perfect, was he? He made some major blunders, not the least of which was betraying Christ, and yet he grew more and more like Christ, and this book is a great reminder to us this imperfect guy was used perfectly by Christ, because we need to be encouraged with that, right? That imperfect people like us can be used perfectly by God 
for the accomplishment of his purposes. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout, you list these places. You see, there's this sort of myth, if you will, that the church only grows stronger in persecution. That's true to a point, isn't it? And then you flee. That's what happens, right? Persecution has a refining effect on God's people, only to a point. If you remember in Romans, what happened? That it had a refining effect only to a point, and then they fled for their lives, didn't they? Now, Romans 8 talks about even while they're fleeing, they're taking the gospel. And so we see that they had fled because the persecution became more than just refinement. It became dangerous, right? And even Jesus said, you know, shake off the dust off the feet, flee the next city. The fact is, we see the movements of God's people because many times the persecution that they start with purifying ultimately leads to fleeing. And we're familiar with that movements of people on a different scale. You think of even Texas, right? We're getting a whole bunch of people from areas in this country that have less freedoms now, right? Their business has been locked down. They, they want a healthier place for their family to go. They want more freedoms and they want more of these things. So people, a lot of people have migrated to, to Texas, right? And other states that have similar ideologies. But in its biggest sense, God's people find times where that persecution rises to the point that they flee. And certainly that's where God's people were in Peter's day. But he says, and he talks about two things. He talks about them, and he talks about God. He says, after, after he talks about these cities they fled to, who are chosen. So number one, he talks about who they are. When you think about God choosing you, you think of adoption, right? Because Ephesians talks about adoption. And so I don't know how many of you were adopted, but if you were adopted, someone literally said, I want them. I want them. I'm going to make them my child. And so now you're their father, right? By adoption, you're saying, I want you to be my kid. So adoption is how God, that's what when we talk about God choosing, God chose to adopt us into his family. He becomes our father. So when we pray, he says, how do you pray? Our father, right? We literally have a father. No matter how our good or poor our dad was in this lifetime, we have a great father who adopted us into his family, God's family. God the Father becomes our father. So their relationship to God was they were chosen. They were adopted. God said, I want you. And he made them his child. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the same you work by work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ. So you have the Trinity, right? We're Trinitarian. That makes us very different from all other religions in this world. It also makes us very different from T.D. Jakes. It's not Trinitarian, right? But we're Trinitarian. We believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit make up one God in three persons. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, neither do I, right? Nor do I understand how you speak and create galaxies. But I'm assuming that since God knows that, that he can tell us what he's like as well, right? So God creates all things, knows all things. And so God is uniquely Trinitarian. So the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, chose you, adopted you to be his child. So you say, wow. Because in the difficulty, you need to remember the blessings. Is that a blessing? Like, I'm a child of the living God. That's a blessing, right? The Trinitarian God chose me. That's a blessing, right? And he chose me to what? To obey Jesus. God chose me to obey Jesus. Because when I obey Jesus, I become like Jesus. Because when I obey Jesus, I show what Jesus is like. Because he chose me to put on display what he's like by loving me, forgiving me, giving me a fresh start, giving me eternal life, right? And so to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Mm. I think our world is lacking in both grace and peace right now, right? You think anybody watched this week and, oh, the sky's falling. Probably not the guy with the horns and the face paint that looked like he came straight on the Mad Max movie and went to the House of Representatives. But the reality is probably feeling that now, that he's arrested, right? But the world looks crazy, doesn't it? 
But you know who uniquely should look peaceful? The ones chosen by God. The ones that God the Father, now their Father, this is grace and peace with you. It's like literally saying, from God, I'm, you know, Peter becomes the mouthpiece for God and saying, God wants you to know God's grace and God's peace be with you. You think that stands out in the world of people freaking out, melting down? By the way, if you, not, if you want to avoid freaking out and melting down, you can't spend all day reading the news, right? Nobody's soul can endure just bad news, bad news, bad news without just what? Freaking out and going on some rant on Facebook. Right? But if you stay in the Word of God and you remember the blessings of God and remember who you are with God, all of a sudden you can start to experience the peace of God and the joy of the Lord and we're reminding ourselves that this isn't our home, right? This is a broken world that needs Jesus. Our home is with Jesus. And that's a blessing. One day, this world will be affected by Jesus to the point where the whole renovation process that began in the people of God's lives will extend to the entirety of our globe, right? The lion lays down with lamb, Isaiah 11, the child plays with the cobra, all these things. But ultimately, if it doesn't feel like your home, if you're watching these things, like, this is nutty. My heart and my soul longs for something more. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God put eternity in our hearts. We long for that place where we no longer face death. We long for that place where we're no longer on the chaos of sin. We long for that place where that chaos of sin isn't a part of our life, let alone a part of the world around us. And that comes through a walk of faith that leads to, when we're walking by faith, we're walking in obedience to God's word. When someone says, man, I'm just believing God and disobeying at the same time, what's wrong with that picture? If you're believing God, you'd be obeying God. So whatever degree you're disobeying God, this is the area of just believing God. And you can't have genuine faith and disobedience at the same time. Not on the same issue. Now you can have faith, really good faith, and, and strong faith in many things that God's saying, and be disobedient over here where you're not believing God. But you can't have faith in God in the same area and be disobedient to God. Well, um, what happens is too many people, when we talk about to obey God, they have a public morality but no private morality. And, and this is what I mean. They do really, uh, you know, if you read their Facebook posts, you would think they're super godly. Have you ever seen people that you think are super godly based on their Facebook posts? They got Bible verses, they got quotes from this person and that person, and they get all the likes and all the spiritual things, right? But behind the scenes, they live in total chaos. You ever seen anyone like that? Which is easier? To do to, to click and like Facebook posts or to obey and love God enough? It's a lot harder to obey and love God than it is to click and post on Facebook, right? And so what we want to do is not simply have a public morality, we want a private morality. We want to be obedient to God when nobody's around and nobody sees us, and we go, I love Jesus, I serve Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and therefore our private lives look holy and not just our Facebook life, right? And we need to remember when we're talking about obedience to Christ, we can't fix the world, but you can fix you. Because God's Spirit is in you, He's given the Word of God to you, so as you walk by the Spirit of God, according to the Word of God, you can see God work and change you as you live in obedience to Christ. And we're not talking about perfection, as we see in Peter's life, but we are talking about progress. So he goes on in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. And this you greatly rejoice, even though, now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So God says, he starts us off by saying that we have received mercy, right? According to his great mercy. So mercy is that not like liberalism says, hey, our 
a way to deal with things is, let's just say this, when, as we're finding out in Houston, right? Let's let people out of jail much quicker. They may murder this person, but really it's compassion to let them out because we're merciful, so we want to let them out quickly rather than slowly, right? And we assume, when we talk about mercy, we're talking about not having to hold people to be punished for what they've done, right? God's mercy doesn't mean the sins don't get punished. God's mercy means he takes the punishment for the sins. You see, in God's economy, by the way, this is God's economy, right? The entirety of this world, every single person who lives on this earth, and everything in the heavens and everything, this is God's world. And in God's world, every sin will be punished. Every sin. Every wrong thought, every wrong action, everything you muttered under your breath, every, every wrong motivation, everything gets punished. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So everything gets punished with death. So God, who runs the world, says, how do you bring justice? This is, it's simple. I kill anybody who sins. To which most people go, I in the wrong classroom. Like, I'm, like, there's a lot of religions out there, buddy. I'm going with one of the other ones, right? I like those a lot better. But it's really not whether you like the God of the Bible. The question is, is the God of the Bible telling the truth? Do you really think he plans to kill for every sin? And if he's planning to kill everybody who's ever sinned, and you really think this God believes the death penalty is the right punishment for sin, then you would say, man, this is a scary deal. It's kind of like a guy I witnessed two years ago, and he wanted to read through the Old Testament before he ever touched the New Testament. That's fine. So his point to me was, after he got about two-thirds of the way through the Old Testament, I said, so what do you think? So well, I don't see how any human being could ever live up to the standard of this God. I think we're all in a deep trouble because if this is what God's like, none of us will ever get to heaven. And I said, I think you're on to something. Keep reading. Wait till you get to Jesus. And you know what? That guy's name is Kevin Poole. And he got saved later that year as he got into the New Testament, having found out that God was so holy, he had never conceived him. But Jesus was so merciful. It wasn't that Jesus was going to excuse the sin, it was Jesus going to get punished for the sin that he had done, and he could go through. That's mercy, right? So if you look for the blessings, you don't have to look any further than being chosen by God and receiving the mercy of God. Mm. And so this mercy, attaining the inheritance, imperishable, and actually, um, has caused us, verse 3, to be born again to a living hope. You know there's a few things you need to live in this world. Food, shelter, clothing, and hope. Because you can literally have people who have food, clothing, shelter, and no hope, and they take their own life, right? You can literally have people commit suicide who have food, clothing, shelter, right? Because they found no hope. Do you think our world has a lot of hope right now? No. Not a lot of hope. 2020, all the lockdowns, all the riots, all the chaos, all the burning of towns, Anybody who thought, man, I'm going to have hope because this election is going to go my way. Let me just tell you, if your hope was in elections, I don't have to be the bearer of bad news. It was already bad news the whole way through, right? Politicians aren't your hope. In fact, I would say your spouse and your kids aren't your hope. And your job isn't your hope. In fact, if your hope is in those things... You have a very fragile hope which will be shattered, right? And so when people hope in those things, my hope is in my finances, my hope is in my job, my hope is in my kids being obedient. Good luck, man, right? Good luck with all those hopes. You're going to be super anxious, right? Why are you going to be super anxious? Because your hope is in this, this person or that person doing what this person or that person should do. But we have a living hope. What's our living hope? It's Jesus Christ. When your hope, if you can by faith, Put your hope in Jesus, that he's sovereignly in control of all things, that he loves you, has a wonderful plan. Romans 8.28, he'll cause all things to work together for good, because Romans 8.29, he is going to conform you to the image of Christ. Now you have a living hope that will endure. Now you can go through trouble, and you don't have to take the modern Christian approach like, I believe, 
And if you keep me from this trouble, I will. Then I then I know faith works. It's kind of like the friend I met with, and I share with a small group on Monday night. I talked to a friend who's dying of cancer, and his comment was, "I've prayed. God chose not to take this from me, so I have to assume that God wants me to walk through this." He has spoken to his kids, shared with them that he will miss them. He will be with Christ, and he's told his son, who has uh, a two-year-old, who is his granddaughter, you make sure you tell her about Jesus, because so I can see her again. But I'm going through this, because God has chosen to put me through this. It doesn't dissuade my faith, it's just difficult, right? That's faith, isn't it? Faith is not the avoidance of trouble, though we pray for that. I had prayed for him that God would extend his life in length of days, as the psalm said, that he may see good. And up to this point, God has allowed for an extension there. But faith is believing that whether God saves us from it or saves us through it, God is with us and God is in control. And really, what you find in the Apostle Peter in chapter 1, he says there's various trials, right? Like chapter 4. Fiery trials. It doesn't get better. You go through First Peter, it gets worse out there. And then in Second Peter, you think, oh, it's going to get all better. Like people are like, oh, this election is going to get better. <laughs> it's not going to get better, man. But it can be okay here, right? Because God is at work. Because we're God's people, chosen of God. We, we have to look for, we have to find the blessings. And we need this hope. We have a living hope. Our living hope means that we will actually have hope because we've got a bright future for all of eternity, right? That could go on. He says, we have obtained an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. If you're trying to say up things here on earth, what happens to them? Man, I'm going to leave an inheritance to my kids. By the way, the, the government steps in line, right? It's right there first thing. Oh, wait a minute, you died here. The government comes in, oh, we want our part first, right? What happens with inheritance? Well, man, land, houses. Some people are like, man, the stock market, that's where my inheritance, man. I get. Some are like, tons and gold, right? One put it. Whatever the case is, your inheritance, ultimately, whatever you're storing up here, you will lose. You'll lose it. No matter what it is, you will lose it. You say, well, my kids won't. They'll lose it in time. Whatever you start up here, you will ultimately lose every single thing. Every single thing. But to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now that is an inheritance, right? There's no diminishing of it. There's no rusting of it. There's nobody's going to rip it off. Nobody's going to steal it. It's not going to rot, it's not going to mildew, it's not going to go to the dump or the garbage heap and be sold in Craigslist. This is an inheritance that's sure and steadfast. Do you believe that? But you have an inheritance with Christ in the kingdom of God. I talked to my friend this week, he said, you know, I'm going to miss my kids. He says, I'm going to miss my granddaughter, but I'm not going to miss this world. Because I've been looking forward to getting in the presence of Jesus my Lord. And the more you walk with Christ, the more that should be true. The more the longing to be with Jesus should be true. In this, you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. First, I want to deal with the various trials in a little while. Various trials means... All these things that come at us, right? We have all the same challenges the world does, right? Does it ever feel like, oh, good, the tire blew up? Oh, the alternator went bad. Oh, the water heater. Oh, who would have guessed? It's the heater this time in the house. Oh, would have, you know, does it ever feel like there's just a lot of trials? Some seasons it feels like one after another, like you turn around and you get hit by another trial, another trial, another trial. And as Christians, instead of what Benny Hen would, no matter what Benny Hen says, we actually, it doesn't erase our trials, it adds to them. Because on top of our heater breaking down and our car breaking down, we have, oh, you're a Christian. Oh. Right? You have the natural persecution that comes 
to those who name the name of Christ and proclaim the truth of Christ. So it adds to, rather than takes from, the trials out there, right? But he says it's only for a little while. Let me ask you this. Remember back when you were in fourth grade, and remember October when you were in fourth grade. You guys remember that? Like, no, nah, man, I don't remember any of that, right? That's like light years away, right? I don't remember fourth grade. Do you know there's coming a day where you'll be like, not in Jesus 6,000 years. Remember your life on earth? No. No, I can't. Kind of like fuzzy on all that. Remember those trials you went through? No? Long since forgotten that. I don't remember any of that. He says, for a little while. These trials are only for a little while. Because 6,000 years from now, you're going to be like, it's going to be so much more gone. This, the, all the trials you're going through now are so much more gone than October of your fourth grade year, right? Can't remember either. But the reality is, these are only trials for a little while. And he says they're necessary. If necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. A lot of times we go, man, I will have peace and joy when I get rid of all these trials. And when I get this paid off, and I get the tires on the car, and I get this, and I'm going to really have peace and joy. And what you find is you just keep going. They just keep going. What you need to say is, I'm going to find my blessing in the midst of my struggles so I can walk in joy and peace. Now, you know there's people who are like mid-60s going, you know, I'm still waiting for that point in life where I can have joy and peace. All this stuff just keeps coming at me. You're like, you haven't figured it out yet? Like, that's called life. Man was born for trouble as flat sparks fly upward, Job said, right? The, the fact is, it isn't peace and joy when everything gets right out there. If this election and all the chaos of Mad Max taking over the house didn't convince you, you should be convinced of that. It doesn't get okay out there. Not till Jesus returns. But Peter's saying, you should be convinced it can be all right in here. Like, you and I can experience peace and joy that should cause the world to go, I have no idea why you're peaceful. It doesn't make sense. Do you have, did you cancel your internet service? Did you seem a lot more peaceful than the rest of us? Did you give up your smartphone that was with all the alerts? Did you seem more peaceful? No, I met Jesus. And I found my blessings in him. He's my father. I love him. He's in control. I trust him, right? And so it's not ignoring problems. It's not like, you know, I'm going to have my head in the sand. It's trusting the solution. What's the solution? Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus ultimately has a solution to all of the difficulties of mankind now? He does. One day, the world's going to act like one big happy family. If you don't believe me, just read Isaiah. The problem right now is, the world wants that, right? They want to live in peace and harmony and unity, laugh like one big happy family. They just don't want Jesus. It's like, you want peace in the world? <laughs> yeah. Want Jesus? No way. You want everything to go right? Yeah. Want Jesus? Not a chance. So they want all of the things that he offers. They just don't want Jesus. But the Bible says you don't get the things he offers to you Jesus. Jesus is the one who's going to right all along. Jesus is the solution to our same problems. Jesus is the one with all wisdom. Jesus has it all together. Jesus knows what's going on, and Jesus is in control, right? So our problem isn't that the world doesn't want world peace. It's they want peace without Jesus. It's kind of like Marxism. What could go wrong? Uh, you know, let's make sure that there's no semblance of God, that there's government with no accountability to God, and no thought of God, and surely that's going to go great. You're like, hmm. See? We want everything that Jesus offers. We just don't want Jesus. One day, the entire world will recognize Jesus, and peace will reign on this earth, right? Well, in this you greatly rejoice, even though you've been distressed by various trials. So you can be both distressed by trials and greatly rejoicing at the same time. So the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by a fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We all know how to refine gold, right? You just crank up the heat. It just blast it with heat. What happens? All the imperfections do what? They come to the surface, you scrape it off. You ever met a Christian who has endured great tribulations and been encouraged by their faith? Literally meeting with this 
brother in Christ on Monday night who's dying of cancer. Hugely encouraging. He's longing for the kingdom. He loves the Lord. He's not without hope. The doctor offered him some antidepressants to go along with the, the, the medication. And he said, oh, I don't need that. I'm not depressed. I'm going to go meet Jesus. Wow. The world's depressed. Why aren't you depressed? The guy was stunned. He knows Jesus. Why are you at peace? I know Jesus, right? He goes on. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him who you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Don't worry. If you're thinking, man, if we're going to be in this whole chapter, we're going to be here until noon. We're not going through the whole chapter, so let me put you at ease. We've only got a few verses left. Hang with me. But he says this. Joy inexpressible. Have you ever had something that was so joyful you couldn't even express it? You couldn't even know what to say, right? You're holding your baby for the first time? Like, I don't even know what to say. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. I can't believe it, right? It doesn't go away, right? Even this number six child, right? I can't believe it. This is amazing. I don't know what to say. This is amazing. Right? For some of you, that was your wedding day. I was a little nervous on my wedding day. It was amazing <laughs> after the fact, right? Uh, during it, I, I'll confess, I was eating aspirin and drinking Dr. Pepper, which I don't know if that's a great combination. wouldn't recommend it to everybody. But the idea is there are times in life that it's so joyful you can't even express it. For me, after that, like, whew, I made that covenant. Also, nice. this is Awesome beforehand, but the reality is this joy and expressiveness says when it comes to Jesus being in control of your life, when it comes to Jesus having a plan for your life, when it comes to Jesus having a future in control for you, when it comes to Jesus even in the midst of your trial, it's there. There's this inexpressible joy. Man, it's Jesus. I can't even tell you all. It's Jesus. That should be our experience, right? Jesus forgives me. Jesus loves me. Jesus is in control. Hmm. Full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. We're talking about we're not, and this is this is a little while, and then we're with Jesus forever and ever and ever, right? As the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glory to follow. And the last verse we'll be with this morning, verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long look. So you say, who was Isaiah writing to? Giovanni. Who was Jeremiah writing to? That's what he's saying. Is they, they were speaking of these things, predicting the sufferings of Christ, the Lord's followers revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you? Who was Amos writing to? What was that? Literally, the Word of God is inspired, which means it doesn't go out of date. It's always relevant, as if it was written yesterday to Renee, or to Jose, to me. That's why it's living and active, right? The prophets who spoke long ago, he was saying, they're speaking to you. They're speaking to me. It's all, all scriptures inspired by God's prophet. And, and they were seeking to know the glories that would follow. They were seeking to know this Jesus who would come, right? We now know him. We now have the fullness of God's revelation. It says, things into which angels long to look. So if you can imagine angels are just, this is astonishing to angels, right? If you can imagine an angel watching as Peter denied, or first rebukes Jesus and later denies Jesus, and then you read them, angels, what are the angels doing? They, they cover their eyes, and, and with two wings, they cover their eyes with two, they fly with two, they cover their feet, and holy, 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 and, and they're worshiping Jesus in the temple, and Jesus sends them down, and what do they minister to? Oh my goodness. This guy is rebuking Jesus. Like, can you imagine? This guy is denying Jesus. Can you imagine how the angels are like, this is an amazing, amazing thing that God loves and forgives sinful people, right? Because they do not sin. The fallen angels, they're heading for hell. There's no redemption. They are going to face destruction. Some of them are already locked in the prison of hell and will be released for a short time at the end. But there's no redemption. But angels long to look, they got to... <laughs> this is nutty. Like, you say to love these people and they just keep sinning against you? The angels know nothing of sinning against God and being redeemed. They only know perfect holiness, and yet they're still so unholy, they cover their eyes in comparison to the holiness of God. And they've never sinned. 
our redemption and the blessings that God has brought us in Christ is so astonishing that the angels just long to look like this is just fascinating. Can you imagine the angels come along watching those days like, really? So, so let me get this straight. We love you, he loves you. We just keep serving you, and then, right? This is Jose, like me. We still make all kinds of mistakes, right? And the angels long to look at that. Like, that's so astonishing that that's God's nature, that he would forgive and redeem sinners like us. So I just want to leave you with this. It's a crazy world, but it's a good God. We need to, in the midst of our difficulties, we need to find our blessings. You need to find your blessings. You need to believe in the blessings that God's given you. You need confidence. You need courage. You need to be encouraged. You need courage. You need kind of steal in your backbone and strengthen you say, no, I believe these things. These things are absolutely, fully, and completely true. And as the world, like Peter's day, got more and more difficult for God's followers, and so it looks like it will be for us, we need to have steel in our backbone and courage to say, I believe the Word of God. So we're taking Jesus out there, not God bringing all of their garbage into our life and, and, and like they were doing in Peter's day. And so you need to find your blessings, and in those blessings... You need to find such peace that you can walk through trials and experience God's joy. Because the blessings are the outworking of God in his people's lives. You and I need to believe that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we have everything. We have an inheritance. We have eternal life. We have forgiveness. We have a Father in heaven who has chosen us, who has said, I choose you, and has blessed us. We need to know that he doesn't always save us from the trials, though I don't think it's wrong to ask that we might be saved from the trials, but mostly we are saved through the trials because God is in the work of refining us like gold. Our faith is refined often through difficulties and trials, and we need to know that, that we need to keep believing, trusting, and obeying Jesus in everything he said, and that takes a lot of encouragement because that's what the Scripture says, that you need to find encouragement day after day. Because you need constantly feel pour courage into you by pointing you back to the Word of God and the truth of God's Word through the Holy Spirit in order to receive that and say, man, I have so many countless blessings. So when it's not okay out there, it's always okay in here. That should be our experience. So let's pray. Father, we come. We're thankful that you are our Father, that you are our Dad now. And we come before you recognizing you're holy and you're perfect. We're thankful that while all sin must be punished, that Jesus took our punishment for us. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, walking in a, in a perfect, sinless way, and then taking the brunt and penalty and punishment for all of our guilt, sin, and shame, and then setting us free after you rose from the grave. Now we know we will rise from the dead, and we will be with you for eternity, and that for a little while, there are many trials and distresses, but that won't be for very long, and then we'll be in your presence for all eternity, and we need to be encouraged with that, we recognize all the time. Help us to do a good job of encouraging one another with these truths. In Jesus' name I pray.